My name is Yvonne Dawkins, and I am Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs at UCC. And I am extending to you here in this physical space, and those of you who are joining us online, a very warm welcome. We really hope that this conversation this afternoon will be interesting, informative, stimulating. And for those of you who actually work in the area of trade law, we hope that you will learn something new. For those of you to whom this subject is brand new, we know you will learn many new things this afternoon. So I want to welcome you warmly and particularly welcome those of us who are joining from other institutions. We have faculty from the University of the West Indies joining online, faculty from the University of Technology. And we've also have invited representatives from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade who join us online. So this afternoon, you will meet our guest speaker, who is Miss Gertrude Boateng, and she will be introduced to you more fully later on in our program. You will also meet our UCC law student, Tanya Goff, who will bring the vote of thanks, and Dr. Marcus Goff, head of the Department of Law, who will introduce our guest speaker. At this point though, I'm very pleased to introduce you to our UCC president, Dr. Haldane Davies. And Dr. Davies will bring greetings on behalf of UCC. Please welcome him. Thank you, Dr. Dawkins, and good afternoon to everyone. It's indeed a pleasure and privilege for me to stand here and extend to each one of you a very warm welcome. Um, just about a week or two ago, I had the opportunity of being a member or part of the Jamaica Trade Mission to the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Uh, there are about uh, uh, 60 to 70 of us uh, on that trade mission representing about 45 different uh, companies and organizations here in Jamaica. We did not only learn a lot and uh, develop uh, relationships with our Guyanese counterparts, but among ourselves here as members of the delegation, many of us were meeting others for the first time. And we are able to develop uh, extensive business relationships that we'll continue to build on as we move forward. Uh, one of the teams represented there, JANAC, uh, is that agency here in Jamaica that uh, allows for certification and to make sure that our goods and our products are at a certain level as they leave Jamaica and go elsewhere. Uh, with respect to international trade, it is important for us to know and to understand uh, what those guidelines entail. Uh, what we need to know here in Jamaica and around the region to allow our goods and our products, our services to be made available in other parts of the world. We don't want to have situations where uh, our goods and our produce live here on a ship and the container is stuck on a dock somewhere because we cannot gain entry for our products in another destination, seeing that we may not have been compliant with the requirements for entry at that particular port. So knowing how to plan and how to operate and how to navigate the international trade arena is very important for us. And that's why here at UCC, in our continued quest to ensure that we promote relevance in all that we do. Uh, we are glad for this opportunity today uh, to host this uh, public lecture. I had the opportunity of um, a meeting on reference from 
different uh, individuals here in Jamaica. Um, Ms. Boating, uh, we had quite an extensive conversation uh, along with other colleagues. And uh, we are honored to have the opportunity today to have her uh, present on this very important topic. And more than that, uh, you will hear going forward from Dr. Guff about another event that we're planning uh, that will go uh, much further than where we will uh, go today, uh, where uh, lawyers uh, from the WTO, uh, United Nations uh, will join our faculty here and Ms. Bortin uh, to ensure that we are able uh, to provide us here in Jamaica and our region uh, with more information uh, relative to trade, investment, to promotion, and a number of different activities that we'll need to find ourselves engaged in. So we are indeed honored on behalf of our board of directors, of faculty, staff, students, alumni, and all other stakeholders uh, to host uh, this lecture here today. And we look forward to your full engagement and full participation with your many questions that you will have as we have an engaging discussion here today. Again, thank you and welcome. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And thanks again for joining us here today. And um, thanks, of course, to our president and to our vice president uh, and to our guest lecturer. Um, and of course, to you all who are joining us online. Um, I can't really see you all online, but I hear that we have quite a good turnout. So I want to thank you all for joining us, those who couldn't make it here. And of course, those who are here with us in person, thank you again for being here. So I have the responsibility to introduce, of course, our esteemed speaker this afternoon. And as President Davies said, we're very pleased to have um, Mrs. Namaka Boateng here with us this afternoon to speak about the importance of World Trade Organization law, WTO law. Uh, of course, this is an area that developing countries need to do you know, a lot of work in individually and together to be able to overcome some of the inherent, um, what we would say are inequalities in the international trading system. Of course, we have to be able to know what the system entails or to use the World Trade Organization tools and rules. Of course, to do so, we need to be able to become familiar with them and to know how to maximize the benefits that they are presenting to us. And so we're very pleased to have the executive director um, of the International Trade Institute for West Africa with us, Ms. Gertrude Numako Boateng. It's her first time here in Jamaica. So we want to really give her another warm welcome, you know. Um, wanna, yes, yes, can you please clap and feel free to clap. Online too, yes. And uh, she's traveling all the way, well, yeah, all the way from St. Anne this morning with friends of hers to come and join us in Kingston to speak to you. So Mrs. Gertrude Namako Boateng is a leading international trade lawyer from Ghana and a staff member of the United Nations office in Geneva for almost 25 years. Mrs. Boateng studied French and <clears throat> she also speaks Russian, and she later proceeded to do the Bachelor of Laws degree at the University of London in the UK. She holds a Master of Laws degree. Yes, thank you very much. She holds a Master of Laws degree uh, as well in International Commercial and Business Law from the University of East Anglia, Norwich in the UK. And since 2003, she has been a member of the United Nations Legal Committee for the International Law Commission. And she also currently holds a fellow spot as the advisory center on WTO law in Geneva, Switzerland. From 2007 to 2010, she functioned as the coordinator of the UN Geneva Graduate Study Program, which brings some 80 postgraduate students from all over the world to Geneva to study and understand the work of the United Nations. She has been mentoring undergraduate and postgraduate students for many, many years and also has a passion for international trade law and how it can empower developing countries and developing societies. 
Mr. Shah has extensive experience in fair trade issues with local communities in Africa, having worked as a senior communications advisor for the African Cashew Initiative, and also with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded project in uh, Africa. She also has worked with several organizations uh, in Europe, and of course, has experience with the WTO dispute settlement system. She's the first Ghanaian woman and the first UN staff member to hold the position uh, for the indicative list of the panel of the WTO dispute settlement system. So we have an experience here. And again, we're very pleased to have her with us this afternoon. So I'm gonna, without further ado, introduce, uh, sorry, invite Mrs. Nimako Boateng to present to you this afternoon on the basic principles of WTO law that govern international trade in goods. Then we will have a Q&A right after that for you to be able to ask and get some further insights from her directly. So please help me welcome, warm welcome uh, to Mrs. Nomako Boateng. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcos, for this very um, comprehensive introduction. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, um, Dr. Hanalan Davis. And um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you some insights into um, World Trade Organization law. Um, before I proceed, I would like to um, correct Marcos on a couple of issues. I'm retired from the United Nations. <laughs> I retired um, from the United Nations um, nine years ago. I did work for the United Nations for close to 30 years, but I'm retired now. And um, um, I established this um, organization called the International Trade Institute for West Africa precisely to help developing countries to learn WTO law to be able to trade effectively and to participate in the dispute settlement system at the WTO. So I'll move on after this um, clarification. Um, as Marco said, my name is Gertrude Marco Boate and I'm the executive director of the International Trade Institute for West Africa. This is my first time in Jamaica. I um, Actually, um, I am an adopted citizen of Jamaica through my friend, Mrs. Claire Stossel, who is in the audience um, this afternoon and um, her husband, Mr. Trevor Davis. So Jamaica is um, very close to my heart. And when I decided to vi visit Jamaica for the first time, I said, um, I would want to speak about WTO law, take my, uh, the advantage of my presence in Jamaica to share my experience on WTO law with the students of the Uni um, University of Commonwealth Caribbean and um, any other interested parties. So um, thank you very much for this warm welcome. And my topic this afternoon is going to focus, um, focus on trading goods so we're going to look at the basic legal principles of um, World Trade Organization law. World Trade Organization, what is it first of all? What is the World Trade Organization? World Trade Organization is a very important um, institution dealing with international, um, international economic relations and um, it is headquartered in Geneva. The World Trade Organization is actually responsible for elaborating rules to govern the multilateral trading system to ensure um, stability, predictability, and also to allow goods to flow very freely on the international market. The aim is to liberalize trade. And um, WTO is through it's various agreements making sure that there are no impediments to the flow of goods on the international market. Not only the flow of goods, I'm talking only about goods this afternoon because the WTO agreement is very, very broad and covers a lot of sectors, 
It includes um, trading goods, trading um, services, trading international property rights, and trade investment. So for the purposes of our lecture this afternoon, we're going to focus on the legal, basic legal principles, the fundamental legal principles governing trade in goods. Yeah. Before we move on to see the basic legal principles, I would want to speak a little bit very briefly about the origins of the World Trade Organization. So how did this World Trade Organization come about at all? Well, in, in the 1930s, there was a Great Depression. And the result of this Great Depression was that countries who were trading on the international market resorted to discriminatory practices they resorted to um, raising tariffs to such an extent that the flow of goods on the international market was impeded. There was a decline in trade in goods on the international markets. Countries could choose which countries um, to trade with. They favored certain countries in their de trade um, deals and then um, exempted other countries from exporting goods onto their markets. They raised tariffs to such a height that it was impossible to export to some countries. And then followed the Second World War, which devastated Europe in the um, late 1930s to 1944, 1945. So um, trade came um, to sort of a halt, literally, Goods couldn't move on the international market. Europe has been devastated by the war. There was a need to reconstruct Europe. So countries got together in the United States in a city called Bretton Woods to find a solution um, to this um, sort of problem in the world at the time, to reconstruct Europe and to liberalize trade. So what did they do in Bretton Woods? They set up the International Monetary Fund, IMF, to ensure that currency was stable on the world market. Then they also were able to establish what at the time was called the International Bank for Reconstruction to help with the reconstruction of Europe. It is now called the World Bank. And the third limb of that um, conference or of the institutions that they were going to set up was International Trade Organization, the ITO. They managed to set up the IMF, they managed to set up the International Bank for Reconstruction, but there was a lot of problem um, setting up the International Trade Organization, the ITO. And um, so um, that idea was nipped in the back. But the need to liberalize trade was so strong that while the discussions in Bretton Woods were um, faltering, some countries got together again in Havana and um, London still to find rules that would govern international trade to liberalize trade, to bring down tariffs, to avoid discrimination on the international market, and to ensure that when people produced goods, they would be able to sell the goods on the international market. So they met in um, Havana, in Cuba, and took out from the ITO charter, the um, organization they were trying to form, it was a very large, um, it covered a lot of um, um, sectors. It didn't come into force because of changing um, situations in um, the United States but they managed to salvage part of it, that part that governed trade, and agreed on the terms of that section of the charter, had it um, ratified by the countries, and that agreement, which was supposed to be a temporary agreement, would come into force as a general agreement on tariffs and trade, the GATT. So the GATT um, came into force, 
in January 1948 and was headquartered in Geneva. It was supposed to be a temporary organization liberalizing, liberalizing trade um, on the international market, but it would stay for almost 50 years. During the time of the GATT, eight rounds of trade negotiations took place. One in Turkey, one in Japan, in Geneva, and then there was the Dillon round, um, Tokyo round, many, eight, eight rounds. And during each round, there were negotiations to liberalize trade further. And each time, more countries joined in the negotiations, which meant that there was a lot of interest in um, breaking down barriers to allow the flow of goods on the international market to sort of um, to foster growth in economic development. As the GATS moved on with trade negotiations, Trade expanded to um, the service sector, to intellectual property rights, but under the GATT, these sectors were not covered. The GATT covered only trade in goods. So there was a need for a more comprehensive trade agreement. And um, countries of the GATT at the time, 125 countries entered into an eight-year negotiations, which started off in Uruguay, in a very beautiful coastal city called um, Punta del Esta. And these, um, so the, the, the negotiations was entitled the Uruguay Round, Uruguay Round, that would last from 19, 1986 to 1994, eight whole years of negotiations during which they discussed the rules that will govern trade in goods, in services, in intellectual property rights, and then in, um, in um, investment. So after eight years, the Marrakesh Protocol was signed in Morocco in a town called Marrakesh in April 1994, and then the World Trade Organization was formed. It came into force on 1 January 1995, and the 125 member states who, um, of, of the GATT at the time automatically became members of the World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization is one, um, an international organization and at the same time, an agreement. And this is what we're going to look at. The World Trade Organization Agreement that covers trade in goods, services, intellectual property rights, and investment with a binding dispute settlement system. It's very important because under the GATT, countries could pick and choose which agreements to belong to. GATT did well to liberalize trade. Trade grew massively under GATT, but it had its shortcomings. It was not sustainable because countries um, could choose which agreements to belong to. We want to belong to TBT, technical barriers to trade. We don't want to belong to the um, agreement on agriculture, for example. Oh, we don't want to be part of the um, dispute settlement body, which means that when there was a case, the, 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 that's the decision of the body did not bind the countries which chose not to belong to it. So GATT was good, but it had its shortcomings. And that is why they uh, met again in Tela de, de les, Tela, what is it? Punta de Lesta, sorry, the Uruguay Rhine to expand it and make the dispute settlement system also binding so that the WTO agreement is whole, it's integral. If you become a member, of the WTO, you are bound by all the agreements, trading goods, services, trips, trims, and the dispute settlement system. Under the GATT, there was something what they called the um, positive consensus. It meant that when a decision was taken, every country had to vote yes for it to come into force, which means that countries could decide not to vote yes. And so the decisions were never enforced. Under the WTO, there's what is called the negative consensus. It means that when a, de a decision is taken, every country must vote no. And of course, countries who have interest will never vote no. So there will always be um, um, one person 
not voting no, which means that the agreement is going to be always binding, a negative consensus under WTO, a positive consensus under the GATT, which was not very satisfactory. So what does the WTO agreement um, tell us? The WTO agreement has a pillar, the fundamental pillar of the WTO agreement is non-discrimination. We saw that um, under the GATT, the countries could um, decide not to adhere to the rules or the decisions of the dispute settlement and settlement body and that the WTO agreement, you cannot um, do that. You are bound by the totality of the um, whole agreement. So um, what, um, inspired, what inspired WTO? What inspired WTO was that open market, open market was essential for economic security. And one another reason to why um, WTO was important was that I said earlier that when people produce goods, they should be able to sell. So they wanted to make sure that there was predict predictability. I'm going to my market to, uh, sorry, I'm going to my farm to co cultivate 20 acres of corn. When the, uh, I harvest 20 acres of corn, I should be able to sell all of them. And so how do I do this? The rules ensure that there is predict predictability, um, there is um, stability to allow goods to flow freely. And this is what we're going to see um, in today's lecture. Um, the WTO agreement, deals with non-discrimination. Um, this is the fundamental, um, fundamental pillar. You cannot discriminate against your trading partners. We saw in the 1990s during the Great Depression that countries erected barriers against trade and also they discriminated against um, their trading partners. They could choose which trading partners to um, favor and those to exclude from their um, international markets or domestic markets. With WTO law, non-discrimination means that you treat all your trading partners the same way, equally. So there are these basic legal principle, principles, and I'm going to outline them and speak about them one after the other. The first one, which is Article 1 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, 1994, is the most favored nation principle, and which means that when it, um, Jamaica is importing um, like products, let's say Jamaica is importing oranges from Barbados. Jamaica is also importing oranges from Ghana. Jamaica, when it became a member of the WTO, said that it will bind its tariff for the import of goods at 50%. Uh, it's tariff for oranges entering its domestic market at 50%. So when it's dealing with Ghana and, and Barbados, it cannot apply 50% um, of tariff on Barbados um, oranges and charge, let's say 60% on um, oranges coming from Ghana. Oranges are oranges, whether they come from Ghana or they come from Barbados, like products. So when you're dealing with like products, the favors that you give to you, one trading partner must be the same favor that is extended to the other trading partner. So you give 50% of tariff on, Barbados um, oranges, the same 50% must be accorded to the oranges coming from Ghana, most favored nation principle. One favor extended to one country must be extended unconditionally and immediately to other trading partners 
trading on your domestic market in the same good. It's very important, the same good. You cannot talk about oranges coming from Ghana and mangoes coming from Barbados. They are two different um, products. We're talking about like products. So when it comes to like products, when you give favors to one country, the same favors must be extended to the, your other trading partners selling or exporting the same like products to your market. This is the most favored national principle. It's very, very important key, non-discrimination. You cannot discriminate among your trading partners in like products. It's very important. The goods must be the same. They must be oranges and oranges, apples and apples, um, naysberry and naysberry, June plum and June plum. You cannot take June plum um, from Ghana and um, compare it to, let's say, Naysbury from uh, St. Lucia. No, they have to be the same, non-discrimination. So this is the first principle, Article 1 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in the case of non-discrimination of goods entering the domestic market of a member state or goods leaving one member state and entering another member state's domestic market. Non-discrimination, general agreement, article, um, GATT, article one. GATT, article one, non-discrimination. Move on to the second article, which is also very important. This is the national principle, uh, national treatment principle. And this is Article 3, Article 3 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT. The General Agreement on Tariff and Trade governs trade in goods only. As I said earlier, this lecture is focused only on goods on, uh, sorry, on trade in goods. WTO agreement is very, very large indeed. It's huge. There are about 60 agreements. I cannot do all of them in one hour. So I've selected trade in goods, which is very important to us developing countries because we trade basically in develop, uh, sorry, in um, goods, agricultural products. We are not um, very developed to do a lot of developing, um, how do you call it, manufactured goods. Most of our goods are agricultural products. We are not, um, we, we, we may have some services, but our main exports, our main export drive are in goods. So I always focus my lectures on trading goods, which I find very important for developing countries. So GATT Article 3 the national treatment principle. This is how it works. When the goods of trading partners have crossed the border into your domestic market, the imported good that has entered your domestic market must enjoy the same favor as your domestic like product enjoys on your domestic market. This is to ensure that there is no discrimination against imported goods when they have crossed your border and entered your market. How does it work? At the border, the, the, the goods are subject to taxes, taxation at the border, at the port, Kingston port. When the goods arrive, the customs officers there charge duties on the goods. These goods, the duties that they charge on the goods are all listed in the schedule of concessions of each member of the WTO. I brought one page of Jamaica's um, um, schedule of concessions, so I'll, I'll get it.
when a country joins the WTO, they are supposed, you see, WTO is all negotiations. It's like you have things to sell. You want to sell the things to some countries. So you enter into negotiations with the countries that you want to sell, how much you're going to charge um, your duties or how much they are going to charge on your goods entering their market, you, their goods entering their market, how much you're going to charge on that. You list all those duties. So you, for example, Jamaica, Jamaica is importing um, lady shoes from its member um, trading partners at the WTO. In its schedule of concessions, Jamaica might have listed the duty it will charge on ladies' shoes, which are entering its domestic market. When these goods enter the domestic market, let's say that Jamaica is also introduced um, producing ladies' goods, um, ladies' shoes on its market. If Jamaica charges internal taxes on the imported ladies' shoes, it must charge the same taxes on the locally manufactured lady um, shoes. It must not charge the duties to such an extent that will um, unfavor, that will unfavor the imported goods. Or let me say it this way, it must not tax the imported goods and the locally produce, uh, produced goods in such a way as to afford favor, accord favor to the domestically produced goods. It has to treat the goods when they have crossed the border, Kingston Port and entered Kingston Market, the same, it has, must treat, accord them the same favors as it accords the same favor to the domestically produced goods, national treatment. If you treat your nationally produced goods very favorably, the same favors must accord, uh, you must accord the same favors to the imported like, always like products that are entering your market. In fact, when it comes to um, national treatment, there's another issue that, there's another issue that arises if the goods are deemed not to be like products, for example, and um, today I asked my hosts about um, rum, Jamaican produced rum. So let's say, I'll use this example. Let's say that Jamaica imports rum from um, Trinidad and Tobago. Jamaica produces Appleton rum, right? So when the Trinidad and Tobago rum enters the Jamaican market, the Appleton rum is there. Jamaica is going to maybe say that, ah, oh, this um, Trinidad and Tobago rum has to be levied a tax of 5%. We don't deem it as the same product as our rum. The question, if um, Trinidad and Tobago sees that it's um, good, that rum is being disfavored on the Jamaican car market, it may complain to the WTO, and then the judges are going to sit down, the panelists are going to sit down to decide, oh, they are not, Jamaica says they are not the same good, Trinidad rum and Jamaica rum. Let's look at it this way. Are these two products competitive? That's the question they are going to ask. Number two, are they directly substitutable? Which means that if there was no Appleton rum on the Jamaican market, will Jamaican, Jamaicans buy the Trinidad and Tobago um, rum as a substitute? You see, so if, the decision is that, yes, they are directly substitutable. In that case, these products are what? Identical. They are like products. Therefore, Jamaica would be held responsible. Jamaica will be asked to remove the task that it's put 
on the Trinidad and Tobago rum, which makes it more expensive on the Jamaican market so that people wouldn't buy it. They will ask Jamaica to remove the tax and bring it at the same level as the tax on the Appleton rum, because the two items, although Jamaica says um, the one from uh, Trinidad and, and Tobago is different from the one produced Appleton in uh, Jamaica, the court, um, I mean, the Dipsu Settlement Body in Geneva would find that substitutable products are like products and must enjoy the same favors once they've entered the domestic market. WTO law is a very complicated law indeed. It took me about two years to understand this second um, sentence of Article 3.2, the National Treatment Principle. I had to read and read to be able to understand what that um, paragraph, sorry, uh, second sentence of paragraph two of Article 3 meant. It's very complicated indeed, but if I have been able to um, studied it, this is what I say all the time. It means that every lawyer will be able to study and understand it. Every law student should be able to study and understand these provisions in the WTO agreement. So we've seen non-discrimination of um, goods entering um, the importer's country under uh, the MFN principle, non-discrimination, we've seen um, non-discrimination under uh, the national treatment article where goods entering the market of a uh, trading, a member state must enjoy the same favors as domestic, domestically produced goods on that domestic market, national um, principle. So taxes, regulations that are applied to goods produced domestic, domestically must be extended on a non-discriminatory basis to imported goods that enter the domestic market. It's not that complicated when you break it down. You, have, you want to put taxes, put taxes but don't favor your domestic goods over imported like products. Basically, this is what it means, Article 3, National Treatment um, Principle. I said I have um, um, one page of the schedule of con concessions of Jamaica um, printed in front of me now. What I see here, I'm going to talk about the schedule of concessions. So maybe I'll put it on the side and then when I get to the schedule of concessions, I'll come to this and show you what you have in your schedules of concessions, what schedule of con uh, concessions mean. So we've seen um, MFN treatment, most favored nation principle, and then the national treatment. And we move on to the other basic or fundamental legal principle of WTO law is the um, prohibition on using quantitative restrictions, quotas. Um, what does this mean? This is Article 11 of the WTO agreement. What it means is that in the past, before WTO or maybe before GATT came into a, um, existence, country would say that we have a quota. Um, Nigeria, you can export only five tons of cocoa to Ghana, not more than that. Nigeria had to abide by that. Well, under the WTO agreement, under Article 11 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, it is prohibited to um, put quotas on imported goods or on goods that you export from your country to another trading um, partner's country. So prohibition of quotas. This means that when you have, um, a country has produced so many goods, there is no restriction on how much it can export. You, the important member, you cannot say that I will not allow you to bring 2,000 tons. You have to accept whatever quantity that country is willing or can sell to your country. But 
there is an exemption and we will come to those exemptions later. But for now, what Article 11 of the GATT specifies is that no country can issue quotas on goods entering its market or they cannot restrict and uh, put quotas on goods that they export into um, another trading partner. So prohibition of the use of quotas on the international market when it comes to the trade in goods, any goods at all, you cannot limit the quantity of goods that enter your market. That is key. And here comes um, the observance of the tariff concessions or specific con concessions uh, commitments when it comes to trade in services. Schedule of concessions are commitments that the trading partners, the member states of WTO enter into the concessions they say they will grant to their trading partners when it comes to trading goods. In this page, um, Jamaica has a list of um, seafood, fish, fresh fish, chilled fish, excluding fish fillets, and other fish meat of heading number 3.04. There's a heading under the harmonized system. We're not going to go there because that is a different animal totally. So we'll focus on the schedule of concessions. So when you join WTO, you list all the goods that you think will be entering your market and tell your trading partners that this is how much duty we're going to charge on each of these goods. So you see Jamaica has put down for fish, fresh or chilled fish fillets, and other fish meat, I don't know what other fish meat mean. When, when, when the, there was an issue, WTO um, dispute settlement body will decide what that type of fish is. But clearly it says that for fish, fresh fish or chilled um, um, fish, excluding fish fillets, they will charge, they've put in their schedule of concession, they've put down that they will charge 50% duty on such fishes entering the domestic market in Jamaica. When you have put down this duty in your schedule, we have what we called bound tariff. You list all the tariffs that you charge. They will charge 50% of um, duty on this type of fish. They will charge 50% of duty on trout. They will charge 50% duty on Pacific salmon. They will also charge 50% duty on Atlantic um, salmon and other fishes 50%. So this is clear. When somebody wants to export fish to Jamaica, that person will have to go and look at the schedule of concessions of Jamaica and see how much duty Jamaica is charging on the type of fish the country is exporting to Jamaica. So that when that fish arrives at Kensing Port, the customs officers there cannot charge beyond the 50% that has been um, stated in the schedule of concessions of Jamaica. It's against the law to do that you cannot charge more than what you have bound. You can charge below, yes, but you cannot go above it. WTO law also allows for um, other charges. If you have other charges that you intend to charge on your goods and in addition to the tariffs, in addition to the duties, you have to list that also in another section in your schedule of concessions. I'm sorry, Dr. Davis, the characters are very small. This is what I got when I printed it, but I can share it with you later. So in Jamaica's schedule of concessions, there are many, many pages, but I printed this one on fish because I know this is an island state and you deal a lot, you trade a lot in fish. So I printed the fish one. So there was a duty bound at 50%, and then there are other charges listed 15%. For all the fishes that I mentioned, 
Jamaica is charging 15% extra, extra charges on those fishes. What Article 2 of the WTO agreement on GATS, um, general agreement on tariffs and um, yeah, on tariffs and trade mean is that under Article 2, when you have done this, when you have put all this down and it's in your schedule of concessions at the WTO, you cannot go above it. You can go below, but you cannot exceed it. It's a bound rate and you cannot go beyond that. If you go beyond it, your trading partners will report, complain to the WTO dispute settlement body. Jamaica will be brought before the dispute settlement body. And if it is determined that they violated Article 2, they will be allowed, I mean, they will be required to remove that measure, reduce that tariff. If they don't do it, there are consequences. We're not going to go into the consequences um, yet because we don't have enough time to do that. We'll do it another stage when we, there is an opportunity to continue this um, lecture one day. So observance of binding levels of tariff concessions um, under the goods schedule, you must maintain that, you must observe that, you cannot go beyond them. So for example, Jamaica says, I'm charging 50% on trout coming from all my trading partners, all the little um, small islands that export fish to you, you cannot charge 65%. And again, if you decide to reduce, if Jamaica decides to reduce, it can reduce, you can always come below the bound tariff, but you cannot go above. If it reduces the um, duty on salmon for, let's say Guadeloupe, it is bound to reduce the tariff to the same level for fish coming like fish, Pacific fish coming from Saint Martinique, Martinique, for example, or from Haiti. So it's always the same treatment, non-discrimination, the pillar, the fundamental pillar of the multilateral trading system. And I can tell you that it works because countries talk to each other, trading partners talk to each other. And when they find that one country is being favored over another, they actually do report, complain to the WTO dispute settlement body and the um, ruling, the, the, the issue is discussed. And if indeed the um, defendant or respondent country is found to have breached its obligation under the WTO agreement, that particular country is made to withdraw that measure that violates the agreement or the provision um, consent. So this is the schedule of concessions. There's a similar schedule for trade in services. It's called um, schedule of commitments, but we're not dealing with trade. So trade in services today, so we're not going to do that. We're dealing with goods. It's goods only this afternoon. So we we'll see that these uh, fundamental principles run like a thread all the way through the WTO um, agreements, through goods, through um, GATS, um, and through trips. They, they affect them in a different way, but it's the same fundamental principle of non-discrimination and treating all your trading partners equally. Another fundamental principle of the World Trade um, Organization Agreement, the WTO Agreement, is transparency. Transparency is to ensure that trading partners know what is going on in the, um, in the territory of their trading partners. WTO members should know what is going on in their um, counterpart countries where they are doing business. So if Jamaica decides to bring a new regulation 
in its um, sale of salmon, for example. This is a new law that Jamaica has enacted, has gone through parliament, has become law. Jamaica is bound to inform the WTO about this law so that its trading partners know that Jamaica has this law for the trading partners to conform to that law when it comes to doing business with Jamaica in that particular product. So Jamaica writes WTO law and then WTO law informs the committee concerned. So if it's about sanitary and phytosanitary measure, phytosanitary, yeah, phyto and san sanitary and phytosanitary measure, the sanitary and phytosanitary um, committee would be informed of this new regulation or law that um, Jamaica has put in place. And then the other trading partners will all be informed. This way, they can do business effectively. It's not that Jamaica has um, enacted this regulation or law. It's silent about it. So the trading partners doesn't, um, don't know. They ship their salmon to um, Kingston port. And then when the goods arrive at the port, the customs officials there say that, nah, they don't conform to our regulations, so they can't enter. This impedes trade. This limits um, market access. All these fundamental principles are to ensure that trading partners have access to the markets of their trading partners. So when you do laws, you have to inform the WTO. You have to set up entry points in your country for your trading partners to get the relevant information about that particular law so that they can study it and conform to that regulation when it comes to exporting or trading with you in that area where your regulation um, governs is very important. And this is transparency. It is to ensure predictability, stability on the world market, and to liberalize trade, and to ensure that goods flow freely. When people produce, they produce because they want to sell and make money. They will not be able to sell if they don't know the situation on the markets of their trading partners. Transparency is very important in the fundamental principles of World Trade Organization law. Then the final fundamental principle is the dispute settlement system. This dispute settlement system is there to settle disputes arising from trading on the international markets for members of the WTO. So what I said, if um, one member feels that um, its trading partner, it's putting barriers in trade um, to hinder goods, its goods from entering that market, it goes to the WTO to complain. And then the case is taken up by the dispute settlement body, a ruling is made, a decision is taken, and then um, the complaining partner, um, the complaining member may be either, um, the, the complaining partner will be given the permission to get rid of that uh, measure that its trading partner would, be, uh, would have put in place. So the decision would tell the respondent if, they find it against him that um, Ghana or Jamaica or Togo, your measure is impeding trade, therefore you have to re remove it. If you don't remove it, retaliation can be ordered. That's a different topic. We'll deal with that another time. So um, the system is there to work to ensure that disputes arising under um, the international trading system gets resolved and gets resolved very rapidly to ensure 
trade liberalization to ensure the free flow of goods, to bring stability on the world market, to bring um, security on the world market. This is what the dispute um, settlement body does. So these are the basic principles, legal principles, non-discrimination, most favored nation principle, um, national treatment principle, um, no quantitative restrictions, um, observance of the um, schedule of concessions, the commitments in the schedule of concessions where you've listed the duties that you charge on the individual items that are entering your domestic market, then you have to be transparent about your laws and also you adhere to the rulings of the dispute settlement body. But all these things notwithstanding, it's often these are what I call or what is called the obligations of the member states of the WTO law. They have to respect the basic rules to liberate, um, liberate to liberalize trade to allow goods to flow freely is their obligation. And if they don't respect these ob obligations, if they violate these ob the, the, the provisions of these um, agreements, they are brought before the dispute settlement body. But they also have rights. They also have rights because we know that on this since the WTO, there are a lot of issues going on on the international market. There are a lot of criticisms against the WTO. I'm not going to go into that because that is not the aim of the lecture this afternoon. But what I'm saying is that when countries export goods to another country at very um, low prices to such an extent that they undercut the goods, identical goods on the domestic markets and get rid of um, domestic producers on their own market, that is sanction, but that can only be done if the trading partner concerned knows the rules, knows um, their rights. So the obligations are the legal principles, the rights are the exemptions to the market access principle that we saw um, earlier. So what are these rights of the member states? The first is under Article 20 of the GATT, the general exceptions of the um, GATT Article, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade 1994, Article 20 of the GATT 1994. What does it say? Members have the right to restrict trade when it comes to the protection of human, animal, and plant life. They have the right to restrict trade if it is against the morals of their citizens. They have the right to restrict trade if um, the, the, some very valuable mineral, for example, um, risks extinction through overmining, they have the right to curtail um, the export of these products. This is under Article 20 of the GATT. It's possible to restrict trade notwithstanding the obligations under the agreement. If a country, for example, sees that um, there is swine flu, there's swine flu in a leading producer of um, pork on the international market, that so uh, we have to use um, names of country. Jamaica imports pork from Mexico. There is swine flu in Mexico. Jamaica has the right to say that now, nah, Mexico, you cannot bring your pork to Jamaica. It's got swine flu. I have to protect the health of my people of the other poor, um, uh, what is it, pigs in my country or whatever I have to protect. Jamaica has a right to prevent, to ban the um, export or the import of pork from Mexico if it has proved that swine flu is indeed killing the swine um, and the pigs in Mexico and importing them to um, Jamaica would 
affect the health of the Jamaicans in um, Jamaica. It has a right to do that and uh, gut. But these have to be proven. You cannot just wake up one day and say, Mexico, no, don't bring your pork because you have swine flu. It has to be proven. But this exemption um, is there, is possible for countries to use them. There's a whole lot of lists. I've given you the one that protects human, animal, and plant life. There was one that um, protects um, natural resources and uh, morals, for example, if one country is exporting pornographic films to Jamaica. Jamaica has the right to say, I don't want to corrupt my young people. I will not allow you to import, I mean, to export pornographic films to my country. Jamaica, if it can justify that, can ban the import of um, pornographic films in its territory. So this is the general exception under Article 20 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and trade. Then comes the security ex um, uh, exceptions under Article 21 of the same GATT General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade 1994. What does it say? It says that a country has a right to prevent um, other trading partners from um, supplying security material, for example, to its country. If Niger um, Jamaica produces guns, automated rifles, for example, and uh, for its police officers, for its military officers. Um, which country? Colombia says we also want to um, sell our guns on your territory. Jamaica has a right to say that due to the security concerns of our country, we don't know what you've put in your guns. Maybe there are bags that can, you know, um, um, how do you call it, which can extract our security measures or something on our territory. So we don't want that. If Jamaica can justify that indeed, the Colombian guns pose threat on its national um, territory, now, um, Jamaica can invoke Article 21 of the um, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and ban the import of Colombian guns into its territory for security reasons. That is also very um, possible. When I was um, studying this um, Deputio Law in Geneva, what intrigued me was that certain Asian countries see that the production of certain um, staple foods um, are strategic and have security, um, how do you call it? Um, it? It's attached to their food security on their territory. So for example, one of these, some of these Asian countries, you cannot, if you produce rice, you know, they eat a lot of rice in Asia, you cannot export um, rice to some of the countries, they have put 100% tax on rice into their country because they are, their countries produce a lot of rice and they want to, um, they, they claim in the name of food security, they want only their nationals to produce rice. So they don't allow imports of rice into their countries for security reasons. Can you believe this? Jamaica, can you do that? Can you say uh, for security reasons, we cannot allow Barbados to export salmon to Jamaica? Maybe if you can prove it, you can, because some of these Asian countries are doing that for security reasons. Yeah, it's, laugh it's funny, isn't it? But it's true, yeah. Anyway, so um, security exemptions, general exemptions, we're going to safeguard measures under Article 19 of the GATT. So, when there is an influx of goods, a lot of goods entering the Jamaican market, let's say um, clothes from China, a lot of them, um, Jamaica produces clothes, clothing also on its territory. But the influx of the um, um, Chinese clothing is such that it's depleting the resources financial resources of Jamaica also 
it is causing material injury to the domestic industries in Jamaica producing um, clothing. So Jamaica can say that, nah, we cannot allow you to kill our industries this way. We put a ban or we put, um, we said in the fundamental principles that quotas were not allowed. In this case, Jamaica can put a quota. It's too, too many uh, things, uh, clothing and entering our, our territory. We won't allow that. They can do that under Article 19 if the imports are such that they cause material injury to the domestic industries engaged in the same kind of um, trade, of um, manufacture. So um, that is possible. Then there's a counterpart, a parallel um, article, which is Article 12, which deals with balance of payments. I think it's a bit overlapping, but well, the beauty law is what it is. And there was an Article 12, which deals with balance of payments, which says that if the goods entering the territory of the um, important country is such that it's depleting the foreign exchange of that particular country, then it can inform the WTO and put a ban on such goods entering its market. This is also possible under Article 12, balance of payments and measures. So these are all rights that member states have in addition to the obligations that they have not to discriminate among their trading partners. Then there is uh, this famous dumping thing, Article 6 of the GATT agreement um, deals with anti-dumping and um, countervailing measures. And what are these? An anti-dumping is when a country sells goods on another trading partner's domestic market at prices lower than what it would normally charge on its domestic market. So for example, China produces, um, China produces face masks. It charges, it sells them to Jamaica for one, um, five dollars, I know. It sells, um, okay, let's say it sells them here for $5 per uh, packet of 100. On its market, it sells the same thing for $10. It's undercutting the prices of masks in Jamaica on the ja Jamaican market. Um, it's, it, this is a very simplistic way, simplistic way of saying it that when the country sells the goods on the uh, important country's market for a price lower than what it will normally charge on this domain, a whole lot of calculations come in place. But in a nutshell, this is what it means. So the same good is certain, selling it in, um, in uh, Jamaica for $5, but in principle on its market, it costs $10. So what is it doing here? It's dumping the goods on the Jamaican market. Maybe Jamaica is also producing face masks, but because it doesn't, um, it doesn't um, benefit from economies of scale, they, they are masks, same quantity, same um, article is selling for let's say $7. So you see the Chinese ones are cheaper, $5 against $7, and it undercuts the prices of the Japan, um, Jamaican masks. Ja China is dumping it goods. If Jamaica can, prove that China is indeed undercutting its prices, dumping its goods on the Jamaican market, Jamaica can quickly inform WTO and ban the Chinese goods from entering the market. Immediately, they can do that, but determining um, dumping is not an easy task and it calls for a lot of expertise. If your country doesn't have expertise, there are a lot of experts on the international market that they can um, um, use to determine these things and to protect our industries. They can do that. There's this provision that they can use many, uh, not many years ago, in 2018, I was in Ghana when um, I turned on the news and I heard that we had three, Textile industries, Tema textiles, Drapon textiles, Akusumbu textiles, they are all dead. Why are they dead? 
because of cheap Chinese textiles. They have, they, they use our designs, our designs, Subra, Yufron, Kania, Nanchibing, all these beautiful designs, Nigerians, and Nigerians, sorry, Chinese. The Chinese people have usurped our designs using printing our wax. Wax is typical of Ghana, West African countries, Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, but Ghana, we have this beautiful wax. China has stolen our designs and producing these at very cheap prices and selling them on our market. And now we don't have any textile industries in Ghana anymore. You see, when they started under Article 12, Article 19, causing exporting goods or import, importing goods that to such a volume that they cause material injury to the domestic industry. They kill the domestic industry. Articles 19 and 12 of the GATT give us the opportunity to go to WTO and say, please help us. This is what they are doing. We have to prove though, that indeed they are charging less on our market than they would charge on their own markets. But did we do that? We didn't do that. And so our industries are dead and they continue to sell our beautiful prints, not only in Ghana, all over the world. So Ghanaians abroad buy them from London, from um, America, from all over the world and then come to Ghana with them. They do also bring them, export them to Ghana. So our industries are gone. I don't know how many industries have been killed um, here in Jamaica from trade liberalization. I don't know. But you see, if we were vigilant, we could use, because there are, we have obligations, but then we have rights to protect our industries. If we can prove, like they say, under certain conditions, if those conditions prevail, we can use these provisions in that same agreement that has given us obligations. We have rights, we can use the provisions to protect our industries. But have we done that? We haven't done that. We as developing countries, the WTO agreement is made for all member states, but those who did this, they know that we are developing and we, some of us are least developed. So they made provisions in here to protect us, but we use them. Another deviation exemption to the market access provisions that we saw earlier is regional integration. If there is a, um, a group of countries belong to, um, a, a, how do you call it? A trade, an FTA, a trade agreement, you can deviate from the WTO market access agreement. Uh, I mean, provisions that we saw earlier, you can discriminate. It means that you can provide a free trade agreement. <laughs> the word free is what I was looking for, FTA, free trade agreement, a group of countries. You have CARICOM here. So CARICOM members can refuse to grant the same privileges as they enjoy within CARICOM to um, countries that are outside CARICOM. Article 24 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade make this possible. You can do that. You are not expected to treat every trading partner equally under your CARICOM um, agreement. You can do that. There's also a waiver. A country can say that I'm waiving my obligations because of these conditions. Certain conditions have to prevail within your country to be able to use. All these come, you know, not at a cost, but you have to satisfy certain conditions to be able to invoke these exemptions to the free access to your market. And I'm sure there are a lot of possibilities, that, that, that there are a lot of justifications for many countries to invoke these exemptions and, you know, protect their industries. Are we doing that? And then there's a huge one called the special and differential treatment 
provision that is um, given to um, developing countries like Ghana and Jamaica and least developed countries like Haiti, like Gambia, like Burkina Faso. The, the, the developed countries, the so-called developed countries are supposed to grant um, favorable trade terms to countries from the um, developing from, um, they are supposed to grant favorable treatment to developing countries and least de developing country and least developed countries. And they are not, they are not bound to extend the same favors to their developed counterparts. This is a privilege for developing countries and least developed countries. But are we using this provision to actually this, um, when, when this thing came into force, they put it in bold that it is subject, they, they must, let, let me read this one to be clear. Developed countries are called upon to take a number of actions on a best endeavor basis. Best endeavor. It doesn't say you are bound. So actually, they are not bound to do that. They must use best endeavor. This is the white manner couched. Best endeavor. Developed country. If you like, some like, if you like, see, if you like, you can do that. You are not bound, but if you like, you can do that. So these are the exceptions. They are available to us. Are we using them? I don't know. Jamaica, are you using them? Have you had an issue with, uh, oh, when I talked about um, anti-dumping Article 6, I don't think I elaborate very well. So when uh, countries export goods to um, your domestic market at prices that are very, very low, and also when, because they are producers are subsidized, the government of their countries give them money so that they can produce more and export to other countries and make money. They subsidize them. If you can determine that indeed these people are able to export so much to my country and cause material injury to my domestic industries, if you can if you can prove that they are being subsidized, you can also charge, you can charge duties, you can either ban the goods from entering completely, or you can charge duties equal to the amount of the subsidization on your market, countervailing measures for subsidized um, goods and anti-dumping duties on goods that are found to be dumped on your domestic market. We have all these possibilities. I don't know whether we are using that. There was a typical case at the WTO called um, the Cotton Three. Um, is a case of um, United States subsidies to its um, um, cotton producers on the international market. Brazil brought the United States to uh, the WTO dispute settlement body and claiming that um, United States subsidizes its cotton producers for them to and be able to export a lot on the international market at easy prices. So it makes their goods very expensive and maybe they can't sell. And the United States was found to be at fault. So they were asked to remove the measure and joined um, what we call third parties to the, um, to the Brazil um, dispute settlement with the United States where three countries from the African continent, Burkina Faso, Chad, and Benin. They were third parties. They are very small producers of cotton, but United States action affect them on the international market because they are all trading on the international market. But you see Burkina Faso, Chad, and Benin were only third parties. They were not parties, the actual parties to this dispute. So when Brazil won the case against the um, United States. The compensation that Brazil received, the three poor African countries didn't have a share in it. They were just third parties. They were just third parties. So, um, well, 
have been signaled. So I'll bring this thing to an end. Thankfully, I've um, covered all the um, provisions that I wanted to cover, the obligations and the exemptions. And so I will bring this um, talk to an end and um, take questions if there are any. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope you have questions. I'll do my best to answer all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Uh, really stimulating, you know, and interesting to listen and to learn from the past experiences of others. And I hope we have also questions, um, both from those who are here as well as those who are online. I'm going to ask for some help with the online questions, right? Um, so you can help us to navigate that. And if you want to ask a question here from in the lecture theater, please put your hand and we'll have the microphone come to you. All right. So, yes, I have a question here. Yes. You could probably just state your name for us. And if you are a staff member or student here, just to say which department you're in. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am Kristen Wellington and I am a paralegal student. So my question is, if there are any instances where a country does not inform the WTO of rules or taxes made, are investigations done regularly to monitor the taxes that are placed on imported goods to ensure that the objectives of the WTO are maintained? Um, they are monitored. That's why there are cases before the WTO. You see, what happens at the WTO is this. The, the trading is not done by the member state. WTO is a member-driven organization. Only member states go there. I, for example, cannot go there and sit in meetings and listen. It's only for member states. But who is doing the trading? It's a private sector, you see. So what happens is this. If you are exporting your RAM to Ghana, it gets there, and the um, customs put impediments in your way by saying that we are, it doesn't conform to regulatory standards or we are charging so much duty. And you, before you export, you see, this is the issue with developing countries. I think most of them don't even know that these schedule of concessions exist. So they just export um, blindly. But if you do know that where you are exporting to, these are the duties and you are charged more, you go to your government and complain. You cannot go to WTO as a private um, um, person, as a trader. WTO is not for you. So you go to your government to tell them, I'm exporting rum to Ghana, but my goods are blocked because this is what the um, customs officer told me. So can you help me? And then your government will take up the case at the WTO. What they normally do is that they contact the ambassador, the officials of the country concerned where you are selling to, they don't go straight to the dispute settlement. They ask for consultations to see what the issues are. They try to settle it at that level and if they don't succeed, then it goes before the dispute settlement body. So in some, those who are serious, who want to do business, who want to take advantage of these various um, provisions, they monitor. And that is why some of them know that their prices are being undercut by dumb goods. So they do monitor. And those who are serious, when they see that there's something um, wrong, they go to complain to their government who go and um, to the, the WTO to make a formal complaint. And the case is taken up in one way or another. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. All right, so we have um, two persons online, and I want to ask a question or make a comment. So I'd like to invite Dr. Padukwa, if you can unmute um, and you can ask your question directly, we will hear you and we will be able to see you actually also. 
if you want. So, Dr. Dukwa. Right. Thank you. Good afternoon. A very interesting presentation. I really love the examples you all use. Right. Are you so we can see, Dr. Dukwa, you are right. We're not hearing. Are you all, you all hearing me? No? I guess. Hello, are you all hearing okay. me? Okay. All right, could you please try again, Dr. Dukwa, with your question? Yeah, um, I, are you all hearing me? Not hearing. Not hearing? Just speaking. Maybe we can then ask you to type it, Dr. Dukwa, in the meantime. Um, the chat okay, box. Okay, so we also have another hand up from Ms. Kimberly Moore. Uh, Ms. Moore, are you able to ask your question live? You can try to unmute yeah. and see if we hear you. Yeah, well, let's ask to unmute. Can everybody hear me? No, I don't think we're hearing you either, Ms. Moore. <laughs> okay, all right. I'll type my question in. I'm not hearing you either. So we can probably take those questions in the chat. Uh, we're trying to sort yeah. it out, but in the meantime, um, you can type the question so we can make sure we have the question. To ask our hello, people. can you hear me? I am hearing you, right. but they are not. Oh, I'm hearing you too, you know, um, doctor, but they're not hearing us at hearing. So, me in the meantime, <laughs> uh, while we talk about that, while we wait on the type question, we have some more time. Any questions from this room? Do you want to recognize Dr. Delroy Beckford, one of our seasoned, experienced experts in this area? Um, and um, so I saw you listening attentively, sir. Yeah. Um, so of course you can feel free to, to to ask or to contribute if you want at any point there. I did hear a question from uh, Mrs. DeMarco Boateng concerning you know what areas has Jamaica suffered with or are we in jeopardy of losing you know, what industries? Um, and so maybe you could if you wanted to. Yes, microphone is right. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Marcos. Um, that, that was a very um, riveting lecture. Um, and, and even though I do these um, every, well, this semester, every um, every Monday, I love some of these principles as they're stated in a different way. Um, my question has to do with the implications of the appellate body crisis. And um, whether there is any significant difference between what existed under GATT and what now exists with this um, multi party um, interim appeal arbitration arrangement, and to what extent that means that for developing countries, especially those who are not a party to this arrangement, whether this means a return to the positive consensus rule, because all that would be required at this point is for a particular disputant to file an appeal. Um, and the, the panel report would have no binding or precedential effect. Um, assuming, for example, that the particular disputant is not subscribing to um, Article 25 of DSU uh, with respect to this uh, bolt-time party arrangement. Um, any thoughts? I very much appreciate. Well, thank you very much for um, this question. I don't think I'll be able to answer it um, right now, um, a lot is going on at the WTO. Um, there's um, a need for reform that they've been discussing for many years now. And um, um, developing countries are being very um, vocal for once in that aspect. But when developing countries sort of um, become vocal, become very active, for some reason, somewhere along the line, they, they become a little bit quiet. We don't know what happens. 
but um, the reform is ongoing. And um, that positive consensus that you talked about, I don't think it will ever come back because it sort of um, blocked the rulings of the panels. And um, that was a real problem. So if the WTO has to be very, um, has to be very effective, this positive consensus will have to be shelved forever and over. And I think um, the establishment of the WTO, the coming force of this agreement has totally shelved. I don't think it's going to come back. We will still have the negative consensus that has played out since 1995 and um, going forward. But for the details of the reform that is going on, I think it's ongoing. I don't want to speculate, say a lot of, um, make a lot of speculations about that. We see how it's played out because I raised this issue with one of my senior colleagues at ACWL and um, we will talk about that if Dr. Davis is able to put the workshop in place. We'll get the ACWL um, lawyers to come and we're going to force them to tell you more about um, this appellate um, reform, the decision that is going on within the um, dispute settlement system at the WTO. Thank you very much. I can vouch that. Positive consensus. Nah, my. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Um, this is voting. Question from Kimberly Moore. She was not able to um, unmute. So the question is, in light of the war in, in Ukraine, does the WTO foresee any change in the current trade regimes in the aftermath? Um, I don't think so. I remember um, the director, the new director general of WTO um, had a discussion of um, this issue. Um, it's not going to, it's, it's not going to impact um, what's going on in WTO. I don't think so. This is a war happening between two countries. Indeed, it has affected the export of grains to um, developing countries. And um, there was a um, danger of um, food security, but um, it's going to, um, it, it, it's impacting, it's impacting export. They found a way around it. The cereals are flowing out of um, Ukraine since they came into that agreement with Russia. There hasn't been any um, impediment yet. And um, I don't think the war will impact WTO, um, the w any of the WTO agreements. I think trading is going to go on as it's, it, it, it's going, yeah. Um, can you, it doesn't work. Hello, I'm wondering if you all are hearing me now. Right, I'm saying I know persons in the chat can hear Dr. Dukwa. So if um, I can turn the volume up here and Dr. Dukwa can ask this question and I'll relate um, to you, Dr. Dukwa, if you're still there. Yes, you I can am. Go ahead and ask are the question hear, again. Are you all hearing me? And I will let me turn up the volume. Are you hearing me? We can hear you now, yes. It's gonna the echo. Chat, the chat box is also disengaged, so I cannot put my question in the chat box. That's okay, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yes. Oh, you can't. I, I can hear you and I will relay. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Um, thanks for a very interesting and informative presentation. I do hope students are listening to you eagerly and awaiting your next presentation on these services. My question is the online shopping environment seems to be a seamless trading process where persons are beginning 
their businesses and entrepreneurs through the online shopping environment. Is the WTO has its pulse on the online shopping arrangement? And if so, how can countries protect itself against dumping through this process? I, I heard the last bit of how can countries protect How can countries against? protect itself when it comes to online trade um, against dumping? When it comes to online trading through e-commerce, yes, e-commerce. Yeah, uh, Doctor Dunko, Doctor, yeah. Dunko, thank you very much for your question. This is a very, um, yeah, tricky um, issue because um, countries, oh, when, when the goods get to the border, to the post office, wherever they um, land into the country's concerned the authorities are not checking the quantity as such when it comes to online and shopping. So um, it's very difficult to control it, but I think what comes online when it comes to commercial quantities um, is quite insignificant. I don't think it's in such quantities that will be able to undercut the prices of goods on the international market. I think that if people are importing large quantity, commercial quantities of goods, they won't be able to do this online. And actually not in Ghana, for example, there is nothing like online shopping in Ghana because they, we don't even have the credit card system. We cannot import goods. And these dumping issues happen in countries that do not have um, e-commerce, that do not have online shopping, um, developed online shopping. So I don't see this as a problem um, in developing, in most developing countries, especially developing countries where I come from, from West Africa, for example, because we cannot import um, commercial quantities of goods and um, by, um, e-commerce, you, you cannot do that. So I don't think that poses a problem um, now. What the problem with dumping is actually the goods arriving at the port in commercial conditions and being, um, you know, in containers. In containers, when you are shopping online, you, do you do it in containers? I think they come in some packages that are delivered to your home. The dumping, the goods that are dumped come in large containers. So as far as I'm concerned, my humble opinion at this stage with e-commerce and dumping is that I, I don't think um, it's relevant at this stage. Thank okay. you, Dr. Tukwa. I don't know if I've answered my, um, your question, but this is what I feel is not feasible under e-commerce. Yeah. Okay, there's another hand up from Ms. Sasha Reed. Sasha, go ahead. Sasha? I'm not hearing. Sashel, you're you're still muted. But while while um while we sort that out, uh, can I ask a follow up question? Um, as it relates to, it's not necessarily about e commerce, but it's about intellectual property. And I know that um the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property right trips um is an agreement under the WTO. And I'm wondering how is the WTO going to deal with um, copyright infringement when it comes to our data, now that artificial intelligence, now that um, big tech companies like Alphabet, Google, and Microsoft are in a heated competition now with artificial intelligence and the software that they're using, you're scraping data, um, our data, data from all across the internet, et cetera. How is the WTO or what are they going to be doing to ensure that we maintain um, copyright protections for WTO member um, states? Um, thank you very much. I'm not a specialist in trips, 
Yeah. Um, so I won't be able to, I don't even know whether there is a provision on this data thing that you're talking about. I'm not aware of that. You see, artificial intelligence is very new. This, um, the copyright thing, the then um, agreement, I think, I don't know whether it includes data, but WTO is evolving. WTO is involved. And at that, there were eight rounds of negotiations each time to bring in, to negotiate for um, new agreements to gov govern a new aspects of trade. So um, WTO will definitely, if the, there was no provision to govern data protection, artificial intelligence, and the, all the things that you cited, the United States of America, United Kingdom, Japan, all these big countries dealing with um, artificial intelligence. I'm sure, see, I don't have the right to go to meetings at WTO. The information that I have, I get from books and I get from the online. WTO is member driven. But certainly, if there is this um, requirement, who knows, there may be discussions ongoing already to find provisions to govern this part of um, the TRIPS agreement. But as far as I know, I don't know anything about this. TRIPS is a very um, different area. I'm very specialized in trading goods. The beauty argument is very, very extensive. And we specialize in different areas. And my expertise is in this area. I do have general idea about um, TRIPS and um, GATS and the others, but about what we're talking about, artificial intelligence, which is very new, I cannot give an opinion on that. I'm sorry about that. If we come back in uh, March, I will get one of my lawyers to deal with that for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting questions. Uh, we're really uh, wrapping up now, so maybe I can take one more question, perhaps, if anyone has a burning question that they need to ask or want to ask. Um, please, you can do so now. Uh, otherwise, we're going to. Uh, yes, right. I'm asked to remind you that there will be a meet and greet uh, right after, so you can come and meet. Um, this is Makaboa thing in person right after, uh, right here at UCC. And of course, um, you can get to. Thank you. All right. Refreshments are waiting. Second floor, room 201. And I know that some students here too are for the first time meeting some of our lecturers, right? As well too, since the online environment has kept us away. Um, so please feel free. I do wanna thank those um, staff members who are here. This is Miller, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us, ma'am. Yes, Mrs. Walker Carby. Yes, Mrs. Kanai Britton, Mrs. Edwards, and Mrs. Uh, Takis Gilpin, Allen, and others I see online as well, Mrs. Barnes and, and others. Thanks for joining us. And being here today, and our students, yes, and families, <laughs> thanks for joining us here this afternoon. All right, well, let us do so with the microphone so we can hear you online, and you'll be the final question for the afternoon. So, please. Thank you so much. Um, my question is ease of trade between Africa and Jamaica. Are all the, the African countries a part of the WTO? <laughs> and how easy is it for Jamaicans to be able to send stuff to Africa? Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad you are interested to know how many member states there are of um, African countries in the WTO. Um, not every African country is a member of the WTO, but most of the African countries are members of the WTO, most of them are. And those who are not members are um, trying to join by um, submitting their, or making the, um, how do you call it? Making the request to join the WTO. So um, when it comes to trading, Jamaica trading with African countries, of course, Jamaica can trade with the African countries that are members of the WTO under the WTO agreement. Even with those African countries that are not members of the WTO, 
Jamaica can still trade with them. It depends upon what Jamaica wants to trade in and what those countries are interested in or what they have also to trade um, with um, Jamaica. But um, with international um, trade, trade liberalization ongoing, countries I'm sure will be very, very interested to trade with any country that is also interested in trading with them. So there was no, there was no um, reason why Jamaica can't trade with any African country. Um, Jamaica has to identify what it wants to trade in, look into um, the African countries to see which countries have the goods that um, Jamaica is interested in, and just um, get in, in touch, get involved, and um, do your homework. Doing that homework is very important. So if you want to trade with Ghana, for example, you want to trade with Ghana in rum, go to Ghana, get your, your um, um, experts, your advisors to see the schedule of concessions that Ghana has at the WTO to see how much duty they are charging on rum, to see whether that is feasible for you, whether you can make profit out of that, to see what, what arrangements Ghana, have, Ghana ha has put in place to buy goods from Jamaica. You see, all oh, this is very important. Don't, don't just get up and go and trade blindly. This is what most countries are doing, and this is what is costing us on the African continent and most developing countries. So just make do your homework, see what you are interested in, see which countries can do business with you, and just go for it, girl. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, you know, it's really interesting that, of course, right now in the diaspora, right, um, there are the discussions for the Caribbean and others in the diaspora to the sixth region of Africa. And so maybe we can get our goods to treat it as domestic goods in the future. That would really be, I think, an interesting prospect. But that's really been an exciting lecture. Uh, we had up to 70 persons online. I want to thank everyone again for joining who couldn't be here in person. And I do want to thank also Ms. Kelly Francis and the uh, hardworking team of the marketing department for their help with this event. So finally, I would like to invite Mrs. Tanya Goff, one of our UCC uh, LLB law students, to come and give the vote of thanks to close this, this event. Pleasant good evening to all. As was stated, my name is Tanya Goff. I'm a second year law student with the UCC program through the UOL. It is my pleasure this evening to give the vote of thanks on behalf of UCC. With that said, all protocols observed, I would like to first thank our invited guests, Mr. Beckford. Yes, Mr. Beckford from the University of the West Indies. Thank you, sir, for coming. Mrs. Um, Gilpin Allen, thank you so much for your time. I do hope that it was beneficial to you. Again, also, I'd like to thank all UCC faculties for being here, our students, our staff, those online. Thank you so much for be, um, being here. I know that I benefited a lot from being here, and I'm sure that you did as well. Having said all of that, it is also my pleasure to thank the UCC management and staff for all that you have done to facilitate this lecture. For those who participated in any way to making this a success, we thank you. Finally, I'd like to thank our invited guest lecturer. Mrs. Boateng, it has been a pleasure hearing from you, hearing all that you have said to us, what we have learned from you, and the fact that you were willing to take your first visit to our beautiful island to grace us with your knowledge, we thank you. Again, I will close by saying thanks all for being here. And I do hope that we take what we have learned today and go make some money. So finally, I just want to announce that um, as the president had said earlier, we are coordinating to have a focused five-day workshop in March, March 20 to 24 of this year, where we will have again, back with us, Mrs. Marco Boateng, she was online then with her team from the uh, IT, IWA and others who will be able to share again their wealth of experience. That one will be um, a package arrangement that we will be promoting and 
Uh, we have it very soon to be announced online and so forth, but we are now telling you that you can line up for that. That's the 20th to the 24th of March. We'll be having, again, a two hour per day, five day per week, a one week session focusing on all these issues and more. Thanks again to everyone who is here and online. We wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you.